Good afternoon. Now, my name is Paul Taylor and I work for the Carbon Trust. And as you may be aware, our mission essentially is to help business reduce their carbon emissions. Now, I work for part of the Carbon Trust called Carbon Trust Advisory Services and our business works with organisations to help them understand how they can adapt to the challenges that face them as businesses in relation to climate change. In particular, my role is of a carbon footprinter, so that's my, my background, and so I work within the food and drink sector, and I footprint things such as wine, or beer, or bread, or whatever it is you can think of, I work uh, to help companies understand those footprints. If you want to understand the footprints of a cow, I am your man. So, what I'd like to do in the next 10 minutes is give you a potted history of products carbon footprinting in terms of some of the history uh, and what we've learned, where we are now and how businesses are changing their approach to understanding their supply chain and their value chain, and also perhaps offer some insight into where we think this field uh, will go in the future. I want to try and make sure that that ties into you. I imagine that you'll work for organisations and I suspect that it will all influence uh, how you operate going forward. So, the history. Uh, in October 2008, we wrote the PAS 2050 guidance standard for product footprinting and uh, services as well. And we wrote that document with DEFRA, published by the BSI, and based upon our work with leading organisations. That's currently being revised and we'll uh, have another version out in the next month, so look out for that. Since that time, we've worked with a number of, uh, of commercial organisations in different sectors to help them footprint their products. And I think earlier on, that work really was for them to use the footprint label, the carbon reduction label. You may have seen it on the side of Walker's Crisps or King's Mill Bread, and it's a small footprint, and essentially it demonstrates that those organisations are going to make a reduction every two years. Often those companies also want to, to uh, advertise the number associated with the carbon emissions of that product or service. And we still see that work today. And to give you some stats, I think it's over three billion pounds worth of product revenues associated with products that use that label. And I think it's over 6,000 individual stockkeeping units internationally. Our work, uh, unlike other parts of the Carbon Trust, is international because supply chains are international. More recently, we've seen companies become much more sophisticated in how they use products for printing in order for them to gather information uh, for their products and their business. So I've worked with Marks and Spencers and for example their operations account for much less than 10% of their entire footprint when you consider what's happening upstream, their suppliers, and what's happening downstream in how those products are being used and disposed of. So much of our work with these major retailers or, or brand owners essentially is helping them understand how they can design lower carbon products. That's important of course because that touches every part of the supply chain. There's something that I like to think of as the, the supply chain butterfly effect where if one organisation is making a change that may impact other parts of that life cycle of the products sometimes negatively, sometimes positively, and some of our work is helping organisations understand that. Now, of course, when I talk about carbon footprinting, there are a range of metrics that are involved, such as water, resources, waste. That's collected as part of the carbon footprint, but carbon is the common metric in which it's reported in. But of course, some organisations want to go into more depth for those particular uh, uh, metrics and, and that's some of our work that we're looking at now. We're also helping organisations understand what's happening, happening more specifically within their supply chain. That might be transport or might be refrigeration for example. Lots of our work is also working with uh, 
group organisations, trade bodies to develop sector guidance, international sector guidance, whether that's dairy footprinting or ICT. So what's the future of products carbon footprinting? Well, as I've mentioned, the PS 2050 is currently being revised, and that's, I spoke to someone from the BSI earlier this morning, that's due out next month. We also have other documents which are going to be important uh, for organisations internationally. Uh, the scope three and products guidance from WRI is going to be published later this year, and we at the Carbon Trust are writing some of the technical guidance for that based upon our experience. Now, why is that important? It's important because, again, it's going to enable much, you know, some organisations who already report their scope one and scope two, the emissions associated within their organisational boundaries, to start reporting their scope three emissions. And in order to do that, they're going to be requiring all of their suppliers to provide information to them. So many of the organisations that we work with at the moment we're helping them understand how to reach out to their suppliers in order for those suppliers to more easily provide the information that they need for those reporting requirements. So the WRI Scope 3 and Product Guidance will be out, as I said, later this year. I think that that will work in tandem with the PAS. We've worked hard to make sure that there aren't any major differences in terms of methodology. And of course, there's the ISO 14067, which is out I think in a couple of years' time, and that's going to be a really important document uh, to provide the key fundamentals of product footprinting. I think in terms of other parts of what's happening in the future, organisations are becoming more and more aware that they're at real risk of not being able to be in business, essentially, if energy prices fluctuate or steadily increase, or indeed if they're no longer able to source the, re the, the materials that they need to make their products. So much more of our work nowadays is understanding uh, what's actually happening within their supply chain in other parts of the world. And I think that's something that we're going to see continue. And I think, if I'm being quite honest with you, um, organisations are looking for their suppliers to incorporate a commercial aspect of their sustainability information. So um, I was going to give you an example of a major retailer there, but I've stopped myself, uh, but I have to talk to you perhaps off the podium about that as an example. So uh, hopefully that's been a, a fairly kind of whistle-stop tour of product footprinting. I'm happy to take more questions in detail about this work. Uh, I'm going to finish with a quote. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a joke as well. So I was thinking about this on the train on the way up, and I really like films. And there's one film I thought of, and it's called About a Boy, and uh, Hugh Grant is in it, and he's, in, in the story, he's uh, scared of commitment. And one of his friends says to him, look, no man is an island. And, and he gets quite upset about this and says, well, you know, I am an island, I am an island, you know, I'm, I'm Ibiza. And, uh, and I like that story, and I think it's relevant here, because perhaps in the past, organisations have been able to work as islands. I think what's happening now and in the future is that more and more often, organisations are having to produce credible information as part of that supply chain analysis. Thank you.